All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. If you are enjoying this podcast, please consider giving a thumbs up and subscribing on YouTube on your favorite podcasting app. This will help me reach a wider audience and educate more people on Bitcoin together with my guests. And speaking of guests, in this episode, I'm joined by Paul Tarantino, where he's the Director of Business Development at Byte Federal, a Bitcoin financial services company. And with a career in traditional finance, Paul learned of and developed an appreciation for Bitcoin through his personal investments, managing client funds, co-founding the Florida Blockchain Business Association, and actively advocating for Bitcoin education. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, excited to talk with him today. So uh, welcome, Paul. Thank you, Bram. I'm excited to be here. You run a great show, and I'm very honored to be a guest. Thank you very much. I'm honored that you're here. Thanks for coming on. I think uh, I can learn and, and the audience can learn a lot from, from you and, um, and, your, and your background. I, uh, I listened, to you, listened to you on another uh, podcast where you talked about you know, the American debt spiral, etc. And I think that's kind of where I wanted to, to start because yesterday I saw an, an article on Zero Hedge that detailed how... The U.S. spent a record $140 billion on debt interest in June, which is 30% of all tax revenues. And the current debt to GDP ratio of the United States is 125%. And so basically, Americans are working more than a week per month to help their government, you know, and, and they pay taxes on their income and they help their government pay the interest on money that was borrowed probably way before these citizens even uh, got any value from the money that was borrowed, right? So it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. But I wanted to ask you, can we talk through the concepts of debt spiral, what is fiscal dominance, and how does the eventual death of fiat money occur? Okay, well, let's just start with a small topic. Then. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, so look at the the way. Uh, let me let's let's step back to the beginning because people really, I think, have to realize that money in our current form uh, is is debt. There's every dollar in existence has an equal portion of debt behind it, and so we call that a debt based monetary system. And a debt based monetary system requires inflation. So, so for a lot of times that's, that's kind of confusing for people to grok immediately. So I, I try and explain it like this. You have this battle that happens between deflation and inflation. And we're going we're gonna to just talk about this from the perspective of money. So deflation in money means that the prices of things are going down or the purchasing power of money is going up. So you can think of that that dollar buying more every year yep. is deflationary. So if in in the natural world in the in a free market where people are competing to produce goods and services they're constantly driving the price of goods down. And that's a deflationary force. So a lot of times people think they hear the word deflation and it has a negative connotation because of the incorrect financial education they received growing up. Deflation should really be looked at as a positive for you as a consumer, as a positive for you uh, as a human here on this planet. The cost of things going down is a benefit for human flourishing. Right, so so we want to see deflationary forces actively imparting themselves in our economy. Where it becomes a problem is in a debt-based monetary system. So so we have this natural thing occurring, this natural free market force that wants to make prices lower and lower and lower, and we have this artificial monetary system, a debt-based monetary system, where we have the central authority that can create money out of thin air by issuing a debt. And if you have, if, if you imagine you borrow $100 and you've got to repay that, and you take that $100 and you build a business and you're out here operating your business and you're competing in the world to try and, and win at whatever 
uh, business operation you're, you're running. Well, through that competitive force, it's becoming harder and harder and harder and harder to pay off this debt that has a dollar amount attached to it that's not going away. In fact, is growing because of the interest rate that's applied to it. But it's getting harder and harder and harder for you to make that payment because of deflationary forces, right? So, so what happens is in order for this central authority that issued the money by this debt, in order for them to extract their commission, extract their fee, earn their interest, they have the authority to create new monetary units. They create inflation. When you're adding money to the system, you're making these prices that naturally want to go down rise. So you create price yeah. inflation by creating new monetary units. Now, if they create price inflation, even though it might be getting more and more competitive over here and you want to, you're in an effort to deliver your product and service at a cheaper price so you can gain more market share, they're creating inflation that's making the input costs to your production go up, 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 up. So, so for them, it's good because they can extract their interest. They can extract wealth out of this battle that we mostly unknowingly are fighting with each other all the time. Yeah. And, and, and so when you start, you start to look around, and you start to talk about, you hear, you hear Bitcoin is talking about central banks being this extractor of wealth, this tax on the system. That's really what they're talking about. It's like, it's like we're, you have this debt over here and we're the hamster on the wheel running all the time desperately to pay down this debt while we're just feeding units of energy and extraction out of our life to that central bank. So, so that, that's the way the money works. That, that's, we haven't got, even got into debt spiral or anything like that. Yeah. But if you, if you don't understand that core, it's really hard to, to understand how did we get where we are today. Yeah. So oh, maybe we, to add to that, like, yeah, because I don't have a finance or economics background, which I think actually helps me <laughs> because when I hear economists talk about, no, 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 deflation is bad. Like if the price is yeah. going down, people are not going to spend their money anymore. Right? right. And I'm just thinking like, no, I, I think of it like this, as you said, we are becoming more and more efficient over time. Right. That is the, that is the, the, the battle in the market is who can create a better product at a lower price. Right. And that, that is the competition at play, right? I think in my perception, that is also pure capitalism, right? Like we are in a free market trying to figure out who has the best product for the most attractive, let's call it attractive price, most fair price for the, for the people buying it, right? But as you said, if the input goes up, forcibly then then you were kind of stalled in that innovation in that in that progress and i usually uh try to use the example of you know a bread was 25 cents in the 1960s and now it's four dollars can you guess which side is winning right, it, right. It, it's it's I, I always think, and I get some slack for this sometimes, but the bread should almost be free. Like everyone should right. have like a super cheap bread maker or something in their kitchen, you know, and have like super cheap bread. But that's not that's not where we're at. And so I think mm -hmm. that is that is um, one interpretation or illustration of how these two forces work with each other. Because in history, you, you've seen that every progression yeah. was kind of like, you know, the we have more energy output with less energy input, right? Like, so we went from people to horses to, to tractors to trains and, and all these things. So it was always like a condensing of energy. But in some way now, we have totally lost this yeah, speed of innovation almost. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, BitGo, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. 
On-ramps multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrambitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building and to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. I, I agree. And I, I think you said an important thing. You said not having that TradFi background helps you see this. I think that's 100% true. So many uh, smart people in TradFi are simply stuck in their debt-based monetary box. They don't think or they've never even thought there's any other way to perform these functions. Hmm. And so if, if you're stuck in that box, then deflation to you is negative because it means corporations, you have to countries pay. are going to default on the debt. And if we default yeah. on the debt, we're going to get a massive spike in the dollar and it's going to shut down economic activity. So, so they're right, but they're not right the way Bitcoiners think about it, because Bitcoiners are thinking about it in terms of how do we produce hum human flourishing? How do we do it in a manner that's fair, equal, and equitable for everybody on the planet? And so if, you're, if you come to this monetary discussion with that question, uh, the debt-based monetary system immediately looks extractive. It looks like tax. It looks like a Ponzi scheme. Right, it, it looks like corruption, it looks like bribery, all these things that we know intuitively by referencing natural law are bad for humanity. And so then we step out of that box with an open mind and say, what are the alternatives? And the, and the first thing you do is you, is you go to gold, right? And you start to say, okay, let's go back in history. Let's look at gold and let's see how gold impacted society, how how that gold system worked, and then what, what flaws happened through the papering of gold, through the rehypothecation of gold, and then you find Bitcoin. And you're like, holy smokes, right? And this is where the light switch goes off. And I mean, Bram, I've, uh, <laughs> I have been the Bitcoin water cooler guy in TradFi for the last seven years, knocking people over the head with this thing, and they refuse to listen. And even the ones that do get it, they, they kind of will, will get it and say like, y yeah, 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 but it doesn't work in this system, right? They can't, they can't, yeah. they can't make that journey to, to, well, let's build the future. Let's build something new. Let's build an alternative there. You know, and, and I think that's just uh, the vast majority of people in traditional finance are riding a desk to extract their share of fiat to go live their life. They don't benefit by, by disrupting the system. They don't benefit by, by choosing an alternative path. And as soon as I did that, I, I was the squeaky wheel. I was the, the guy who was constantly causing problems, the guy they were afraid of, the guy they had to question. Right. And it just it slowly got me to the point where it's OK. Well, you're 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 you have two choices. You either shut up or get out. Right. So mm. uh, I'm out. <laughs> well, it's 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 uh, it's funny. Right. Because 
if you're not allowed to ask questions, then how strong is your basic uh, thesis about what, what what you're doing, <laughs> right? I think mm -hmm. that's already signal enough. But yeah, I'm, I'm not. I, I, I'm not I, gonna I, love, name... I love this. Huh? I was just to say I don't want to name names, of course, but I literally had executives at my last firm say, "Come and watch some of my Bitcoin presentations." Say, "Wow, I learned a ton." You're totally right, but we can't talk about this. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, <laughs> that tells you everything yeah, you need great. to know. You're totally yeah, right, but yeah, we cannot yeah. talk to clients about this. Yeah, and well, uh, that's when that's I was like, okay, it's never going to change. I, I'm out. Yeah, well, that's also why, and and we'll definitely get to that. I think we both see uh, Bitcoin as a as a philosophical and 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 perhaps also a spiritual uh, development. But I I, I want to go back to Okay, so if this is the system of money, right? And it's a debt-based yeah. system. Also, again, I don't have a finance or economics background, but I once had someone with a PhD in economics tell me, you know, no, the value of the money is derived from the, from the promise that the debt that it's created for is going to be paid back. And I was like, sure. what are you talking about? <laughs> this is, and, 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 and I will say why. Because it's made up, it's created, it is engineered, right? And so yeah. you cannot you, you you cannot go past the fact that the money that we use is engineered, right? Like if I hear, you know, uh, Christine Lagarde say, ooh, the, we have to tame the beast of inflation or inflation came out of nowhere. I think like, no, like it's just not rational talking, right? You no, created no. the system. A system was created. You cannot be like, ooh, yeah, these are forces that, like, like almost as if they are nature's forces, right? And we cannot, you know, do anything about it. And so just for me, how my Bitcoin thinking went is like when I hear people use these types of arguments, I just know that they're talking BS. I, I might not have the entire answer, but just the, the way of reasoning just shows me that the initial foundation is just incredibly uh, flawed, right? Yeah. Like it, 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 once, it, once they go there. So... Okay, we have this debt-based monetary system. Mm -hmm. Then we are now, uh, you know, uh, uh, I said just off mic, I listened to a lot of uh, James Lavish's talks. He talks sure. about the debt spiral. So okay. uh, a country uh, has a lot of debt. They have to pay a lot of interest. And in order to pay the interest, because if the money loses more value, less people are productive. So they have less, you know, tax revenue, less, less government yeah. revenue. So they need to borrow more money to pay the debt, right? Um, yeah, is that the debt spiral? It, I mean, it, in essence, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. But yeah, it's uh, the debt spiral or the doom loop is is getting into this cycle where the interest on the debt or you don't have, the government does not have enough income or tax revenue on GDP in order to pay the interest on the debt. And so therefore, yes. it adds to the debt because they have to borrow money to, conti to continue to pay that bill. So it kind of it kind of looks something like this, and I, I sum it up in my presentation as this just the circular flow that's sort of never ending. And it, it's exactly like you said, to pay the government debt, the government borrows more money from the Federal Reserve. And in doing so, in, in, in that process of borrowing money, they, they increase the overall supply of money. If that, therefore, if that supply of money is increasing, inflation goes up, right? This is like our, our first debt-based uh, yeah. debt monetary system question, right? If, if you had a scale and you think of everything you want to buy and sell or the, the price of all the goods and services you want, have a price in dollars and they're equal, right? So you've got this much stuff in the world, it's equal to this many dollars. But if yeah. you add on the scale, if you add more dollars, the price of goods and services goes up. And so that's a, that's a very simple way to understand what inflation is, meaning increase money supply, prices go up. Yeah. And that when, it, another way of thinking of prices going up is thinking your dollar is losing purchasing power. Okay? So yes. The apple is not more uh, trendy or the bread is not more trendy or the whatever, right? Right, right, like, right. right. There's, you, you literally, it's not like you're having any more or less consumption. 
the 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 number mm-hmm. of goods and services in the world has not gone up or down. It's just simply this this is held constant, and we're going to raise or lower the money supply, right? It's like uh, yeah. if you're if you're playing Monopoly, and instead of getting two hundred dollars every time you pass go, you got four hundred dollars. Do you think there'd be uh, uh, more hotels and, and homes on the board or less? Right? It, it's just <laughs> It's just all that stuff goes up. All right, so so money supply goes up, therefore inflation goes up. There's a loss of purchasing power. Okay, so once inflation goes up, the central bank or the Federal Reserve in the United States, they have a mandate to do a couple of things. They do a lot more than these two things, but let's just stick with their stated mandate, right? Price stability, i.e., fight inflation. So we've said money goes up, therefore inflation or prices go up. The Fed says, oh, it's our mandate for price stability. So we need to fight inflation. So that triggers the Fed to start raising interest rates, which we've just seen this recently, right? This is what this is uh, what's happened over the last uh, two or three years. We've just seen a constant yeah. increase in interest rates. As those interest rates go up, any new borrowing that the government does at, means that the interest on the government debt is going up. So if the interest on the government debt starts to increase and we are already in a position where they don't have enough tax revenue to pay that debt, then we're growing the pile of debt. The interest on the debt is growing. Therefore, the pile of debt is growing because they can't afford to pay it in the beginning, in, in the first place. So this yeah. total pile of debt keeps going up. The interest on that debt is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the government, when faced to pay on that debt, says, well, we can't afford to pay it, so we, ne- we must borrow more money. So they go back to the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve issues more debt. They have more money at the tre- or the Treasury issues more debt. The Federal Reserve buys that debt, puts more units in the system, and the cycle starts to repeat because every time that Treasury issues more debt to get more monetary units, they did what? They increased the monetary supply. The money supply goes up. Yeah. More money supply, more inflation. More inflation, higher interest rates. Higher interest rates, larger debt burden. Repeat until the entire system collapses. So this is, this is the way, like, um, you know, uh, third world countries that haven't been able to print their own currencies, this is the way they go into hyperinflation very, very quickly. In countries like the United States that have a world reserve currency, this game can play out for many, many decades. But it's exactly the same game. And so it's, it's like watching a slow motion train wreck. And uh, I think a lot of people are ignorant of it or don't believe what we're talking about is real because all they're hearing is debt bad, too much debt. And they, people have been saying that since the 80s or 70s, right? Um, so yeah. if, you, if you've been hearing too much debt, debt is bad, and it hasn't had an impact on government operations for 40, 50, 60 years, it's easy to dismiss. But you and I and other Bitcoiners know we've sort of, we've crossed this threshold now into what we call fiscal dominance, which is where we have the interest on the debt growing at an exponential rate. Therefore, even without adding more spending, the debt is growing in and of itself. It's like your credit card going from a 0% introductory rate to a 20% rate. And you, you, you ran that credit card up when it was at 0%. And now all of a sudden you're, you can't afford the monthly payment. And so now the credit card debt's just growing and growing and growing and you can never, you can never grow out of it. And, and so the government is hitting that point and that is the death cycle. Yeah. I think one thing for me that was really interesting to learn is when you, when you said, you know, like the one, one task of the Federal Reserve is to 
set the rate for money, basically. They, they set the cost for money, which is already a very interesting uh, concept by itself, right? So they mm -hmm. influence the worth of, of the money and therefore they influence the, the cost for people who want to borrow money, for example, to build businesses, etc. I think this is an ent entirely different topic as to you know what you could think about that but i think what i took away from it is that you know if we would do a value exchange in a free market we are not in a free market if if there's a third party who influences the co the cost of the reward that we use to to uh, well to reward the the supply side of the of the value exchange right so again for me that was kind of like as a rational person i thought like oh this doesn't really make sense but i think this is right. another topic but interesting and another they, another way to yeah. look at that is that it it's the rate of extraction exactly yes and and that used to be very small right so people people don't notice but now uh, also the debt that a country um g gives out or how do you say it? well yeah that used to go through treasury auctions right so other people or other countries would buy the debt of well in this case the united states you see that those uh, auctions also get worse and worse but now it's like the treasury is buying them am i saying that correctly or uh you know it's it's like a it's like a little cash uh circle no like you you buy your own treasuries and then it looks like the auction went okay right and then mm -hmm. still but, but that actually accelerates the entire um debt spiral right because you cannot export the inflation of the money to other countries again and right. so you have to do it to your own citizens right that's right so in in the banking world they call it check kiting <laughs> which is illegal and you go to jail for but at the central between all the big commercial banks right um it, it's mm. it's totally illegal <laughs> yeah and so this this uh, spiral goes on you have this fiscal dominance which means the the economic condition when you know debts and deficits are so high that any monetary policy so any uh, uh, how do you say any action by the Fed is just they lose control over over the spiral. Yeah, so um, lose, losing control is a is an interesting uh, word. Because um, or, or other way around, they cannot right. control no, it I mean, like they want to. It's, it's. I think, I think that's the way it ends up. But there's, hmm. I mean, it's kind of surprising, right? It's it's shocking, I think, to Bitcoiners, how much pain people have absorbed in the U.S. Right? I mean, <laughs> uh, you know. Tea Party, the original Tea Party, you know, freaked out over a two percent tax, right? Yeah, we, we have had. Uh, that was the revolution, seen, you mean? Yeah, we, we've had we've seen people. Um, the price of food, the price of gas, the, the price of energy, the price of everything, right here in the United States, has gone up by twenty, thirty percent, forty percent in some some instances over the last three years. So what people people put up a sticker that said, you know, Biden did that. You know, it, it's it. I don't know. It's like when are people going to wake up? It, it seems like Americans used to be, uh, and I, I think I, I, listen. So Americans used to be a, a a lot more eager to take action, a lot more willing to even our media, right? Our media was a lot more willing to point out the corruption, the deception. The things that were going wrong in the country. Um, nowadays, the media does not have our voice, and it does not have our back here in the United States, right? So, um, what is it going to take before enough people are angry enough to stand up, right? And this is where um, I think we're kind of like the boiling, uh, the frog in a boiling pot, right? So, you, we definitely have Americans waking up. But we don't have a voice at the table, and and where do we hit the sort of boiling point here in this country where people begin to say, "I've had enough," and and we re, and and we take action. Um, so this is a a really interesting and I think kinetic point 
in history for the United States right now, going into this election, uh, whatever the results of that, the, the, pro the electoral process, who gets to be the final candidates. We're going to learn a lot about uh, ourselves as Americans again and, and, and where we are uh, in our own mindset and our voice at the table. I think a lot of people are beginning to realize that they, their voice has been, um, they've, they felt free. They felt like they could say what they wanted to say until COVID. And maybe some voices were strangled during that time and it started to wake some people up. Um, but I think a lot of people are now waking up to the idea that like, holy cow, has my voice really mattered? And, has it, and how long has it not mattered mm -hmm. for? And, and so, so that, that whether, whether, you know, that, that process of, of saying, man, do I, do I really have a say in this system is, is making people question the system. And I think this is why we're starting to see people wake up to Bitcoin. One, one of the many, but, but uh, I, I think people are beginning to make that connection. Yeah. And so, and so yeah, this, this is what I wanted to ask you. Like, why does nobody seem to understand that, uh, you know, as I replied to that Zero Hedge article, that, that they are working to pay the interest on debt that their government maybe made Forty years ago, right? Where, where forty years ago, you know, they took economic energy from the future, they borrowed it, they spend it. Nobody knows if they spend it in a responsible way. But thirty percent of your time, you are working to help your government pay interest on mm -hmm. borrowing debt money, right? Right. Yeah, I just want to ask you why? Why? Why do people not see that? Are they? This is kind of what I learned from doing this podcast. People are just too busy in the, well, you mentioned hamster wheel before, right? But they, yeah. they literally do not have time to reflect on it. I, I think that's part of it. Um, that, that, that's a great question. I think there's, there's so many layers in this. I think at the highest level, we're, we're, we're talking about the fourth turning. We're talking about generations forgetting history right and and so the greatest generation that fought for us to hopefully never have to experience this again is almost all gone how many of their children learned those lessons some of them right i, I can remember uh being told i can remember uh but i can also remember my parents really kind of discounting my grandparents history as like oh you know she just she's a depression baby grandma's very you know just never going to get it and 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 the, they're rushing into taking on enormous amounts of debt and extracting value uh, you know today from the future uh and o almost uh, like thinking that the lessons that grandma was trying to teach the uh or that their mother was trying to teach them, my grandmother were kind of like silly, right? And so then it gets to the next generation, and and you know you you it gets even further in the past, and that memory is lost, right? And now we have a current generation that thinks like, wait, wait, this is what do you mean? The debt's fine. Debt, we've had debt forever. Debts always expand. They just increase it, and you get this, right? You that's why we have MMT. We have a whole generation of MMT people that, that believe none of this stuff has any impact. So this is where I think Neil Howe um, does a really good job of explaining um, generationally how this this we get ourselves into this problem every eighty to hundred years. Now, yeah, some of us that have studied history or have looked at long term economic cycles or just just know it intuitively. Go this this, they, they, we are grokking this point in history as a dangerous point, right? Now, if you go below that, or if you go below that sort of big cyclical pattern, you can just sort of see the. I can see a, a huge difference between the educational system I grew up in, the educational system my kids are coming up in, um, and. I hear from them what they're being taught. I hear the lessons they're learning. I see their books. I'm like, holy smokes, this is, what the hell are they teaching you? 
right? So you can see it in real time. Also, uh, I'm lucky enough to have lived long enough to be able to like go back and remember what the media was like when I was a kid, when I was my kid's age, and how they always questioned government. Maybe we weren't, weren't getting the full truth, but at least we were asking the questions, right? And we, and, um, we were pointing out corruption, free to do that. That's not happening anymore, right? So, so there's layers upon layers. And earlier we were talking about this, uh, you know, the Whitney Webb's idea of one nation under bribery. And I think that's the way these whole systems operate. And that there's a, a natural incentive um, to go along with the system. And so if you've got, you know, a very small percent of psychopaths at the top that really have our worst interests at heart and, and really don't matter or they don't care about human prosperity and they don't, they don't care about human life, they're doing whatever they can for power, control, money. Underneath them, you've got the narcissist that are very easily bribed. They, they can very easily sit next to the money printer, take the money, do whatever's in the, uh, uh, the psychopaths tell them to do because it's in their best interest because they're going to make a ton of money. And these are the, the individuals that we see at the surface level that we point at and yell at from the system, right? Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, right? That we're, you know, uh, George Soros, you name it. We can sit here and we can yell at them and point at them as, as the problem. But they're, they're maybe second layer. And then underneath that, you've got all these administrators where, like you said, I've got a, I got a good job. I got a good paycheck. I've got a, I'm putting my kids to school. I'm going to be successful. All I have to do is turn a blind eye to anything that I see that's corruption and keep my mouth shut. And I'm going to keep getting paid and I'm going to live a great life. And it's this cognitive dissidence that they maintain, pat themselves on the back for doing a good job, tell the world how amazing they are with their titles and their credentials, and they keep getting the paycheck. And then underneath that, you have these giant base of fiat plebs that are just like, how am I going to buy gas? How am I going to feed my kids? How am I going to buy a car? How am I going to fix the roof? That don't have the time, right? They might know the truth. They know the system's not fair. They know they're being, their wealth's being extracted. They know the harder they work, they're not getting ahead. But they don't, they don't have a, a system by which to break out, right? And so they're left with, I can't even participate other than yelling at the system that's repressing me. So, so that, that's a, a, a bribery pyramid that is literally built into the system that makes it very hard for the vast majority of people to break out. Bitcoiners are saying, we see this pyramid of corruption. We are going to start to stack our way out of this. We're going to start to move into this whole new system and break out of this, uh, this corruption pyramid, this extraction pyramid, and, and, and figure out how to build a new life. But that, that's a very small percentage of people. But, but t here's the hope. The hope is that, that if you look at power structures, you really only need a small percent of the population of the planet to make a huge difference. If you take that small percentage of people, you empower them with wealth, you empower them with knowledge, you give them a peer-to-peer -peer monetary system so they can do contract with each other, you give them a cryptographically secure way to communicate so that they can't be silenced, you have the tools for a global revolution. This is what Bitcoin promises, and this is what Bitcoiners are building. It doesn't take a lot of us to fix the entire system for all of humanity. So th that is what I'm hopeful for. That's what I, I figure, you know, like we can yell and yell and yell at the system. Like Jeff Booth says, it's not going to get anywhere. But if we can power, empower each other and we can support each other as a tribe, as a global tribe to build the future, we'll fix the system and all the sheep will come with us. They will follow the herder. They'll follow the sheep herder that gives them the best plot of grass. 
So they, we don't have to convince all of them. We have to build the greener pasture, open the gate and say, come on in. And they will come with us. Yeah. And they will leave yeah. the fields of death and the desert of destruction that they're currently in. So, so we don't have to get everybody to buy a Bitcoin. We don't have to get everybody to hold their own keys. We have to get a core group of well-educated Bitcoiners that are cryptographically secure, they're communicating with each other, that can build the future. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I, uh, I agree. I don't think it takes that many people. I also agree that we should create an example and show and talk about what that new paradigm is and where where people are then moving to right mm -hmm. um is this why bitcoin is such a big idea i mean we 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 all say bitcoin is a solution to mm -hmm. well everything i think we just talked about for the past 30 minutes but why is it such a big idea is it that what you just said or is it something else Oh, I mean, I, 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 I think that that's, I think that's it. But that all stems from this one core principle of giving everybody on the planet the ability to own property that can't be confiscated. So that's the big yeah. idea. That's that's the spark. Everything that comes after that is what what we just described, and and and. and because that yeah. seems like such a, especially for people in the United States, oh, I own property, right? <laughs> Meatheads have no idea that they don't own their property, that it can be taken from them. Um, but, and they have no idea that 90%, 99% of the world has no, no true ownership, right? So uh, I think you take that little spark and giving property rights to everybody on the planet is layer one everything that we we have to build all this other stuff on top of it in order to build a society on that one core value and and that that's i think where it fixes this this is where it start you know that one spark starts to fix things for everybody yeah well it's it's aligning incentives at the base layer right and then yeah. everything that is built or being done on top has to adhere to this ultimate transparency at the base layer. I think for me, that's kind of the summary. If, if there's anything we are, you know, carrying out or, or like uh, proposing is like, this is a technology that takes out all the human greed and all the human corruptibility. And we adhere to this set of rules. And we do that because everyone else adheres to the set of rules. You know, I like, I like that thought a lot. Yeah. So you actually, do not think, have to trust anyone. Anyone. Right. I think it actually hacks human greed, as opposed to eliminates yes. human greed. Right. So, yeah. All right. I think yeah. that's what you said. Maybe. Maybe I misunderstood. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. It we'll, we'll, it. we'll get to that. We'll get okay. to that. I have, I, have, I have a question about that. No. No. But I think like that is that is uh, if I would answer would answer that question is that's for me why it's such a big idea. It solves our mm -hmm. own innate greed and corruptibility mm. and it's really i think the first time ever that we have a decentralized technology that solves a certain human trait in a in a or, or facilitates a certain human trait in a in a very positive way and that is why it's so big because first we have to acknowledge that we are all flawed <laughs> you mm -hmm. know but i sure. think yeah we'll, we'll we'll get to this i wanted to ask you about like your journey into bitcoin because you came from a tradfi background sure. how did your your evolution as a bitcoiner go um so i i've always always throughout my career in tradfi i was never uh satisfied with all the conflicts of interest that i just saw built into the system right meaning what our back office was doing with securities versus what the front office was telling clients to do with the securities right me you know you, you buy and hold forever we're going to trade the shit out of this stuff in the back office we're, and we're not even going to hold it over the weekend or, or overnight so, so like the the complete hypocrisy 
and and then in seeing the system use the clients as as like the chattel in the system you know um the ex extracting as much net worth as you can out of them so that you can churn and make wealth on on the back end and, and it was it, there was so much hypocrisy in the system there's so much wealth extraction and really made me begin to question like what the hell are we doing we're just we're completely full of shit so then you begin to dig in why why is the system like this how how is this system really functioning and and for in my early days that led me to gold and so i was always looked upon as like this stupid person because i always had an allocation of gold in my portfolios and it was like it was my like my little chunk and it's not like i put it there because i'm going to get some great return for the client it was it was there because i could talk to the client about monetary history <laughs> why do we have gold in the portfolio well here's why and then i could talk to them for an hour about the monetary system and how the debt based monetary system works and what ha would happen in a financial collapse and and we would talk about you know these these sort of this flight to quality if all this debt started to implode right um, and so then after those kind of conversations, everybody, oh yeah, let's have some gold in the portfolio. That makes sense. Then, then I remember reading a research report about Bitcoin in 2016. I'd heard about it previously and I completely discounted it because I was like, yeah, that's techie stuff. That's never going to work. and It's never going to impact finance. Uh, and then obviously it got traction it, and, it, and it showed me like, I better learn about this because there's something happening here that, that I don't understand. And so I just bought some, uh, you know, I just late 2016, I just started buying a little bit. I mean, little tiny little bits. And by, I remember by mid 2017, I was like kicking myself in the head. Like, why did you not buy more? And then, and then I started ramping up my purchase into the second half of 2017 into the blow off top at 20,000, right? But like any, uh, new person, so, so don't feel stupid. We're all stupid in the beginning. And if you, if you weren't as stupid as I am, you're, you're lucky or brilliant. <laughs> but I, I was just yeah. as dumb as any other shit coiner. I was out there buying Bitcoin, learning about every other project funneling this stuff to exchanges all over the planet, buying every little coin that I'd heard about and thinking it's like, okay, well, it's this blockchain is going to change the world and Bitcoin, Ethereum. Um, oh God, I can't remember half of the damn coins that I bought back then. Right. I've been to some, at one point I had a portfolio of something like 50 coins. And in order to get all those coins, I had to sell my Bitcoin. Right. It was like the dumbest thing I could have done. Ouch. Yeah, yeah, right? But that's how I learn. I've always learned by making mistakes, right? Yeah. My wife knows that uh, better than anybody. But so anyways, you, you, you run this all the thing all, all the way up to 20K. And uh, of course, you get to the top, Bitcoin starts to slow down and you, you're even funneling more money out of Bitcoin into altcoins. Uh, but through this through this process, right? I, I begin to witness that none of the altcoin projects are really ever being built. That they're all just conceptual ideas that have no real build, no real execution behind them. And so you, 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 you realize you're being scammed, right? And right around that same time, uh, I found Tone Vase. I was very lucky, and I, I thank Tone for this uh, whenever I see him. It, it, was, it was really Tone Vase, uh, Giacomo, um, uh, Jimmy Song, and others that, that really started pointing out to me the corruption and uh, fabrication that was taking place in the altcoin ecosystem. And so it was a year and a half process of selling coins, pulling that back, buying Bitcoin all the way down. Uh, and and I've never looked back. I've just bought Bitcoin since, and it really helps you clarify. It really helps you focus. It, it 
I mean, at the end of the day, I think that whole circle, that whole ride taught me that the killer app for cryptography is money. And the only yeah. coin, the only coin that has the potential to separate money from the state is Bitcoin. Yes. The virgin birth of Bitcoin, the, the loss of the creator, whoever Satoshi Nakamoto was, is a blessing. The fact that, that the people have taken this and the people are now running the network is a blessing. And, and we will not get this opportunity again. So to me, um, it, was a, it was a painful lesson to learn. I'd be a much, much, <laughs> I'd be a very wealthy person today if I had all those coins back. But it was an important lesson to learn because it focused, and it focused me on what's important. And yeah. uh, you, I'm sure you see it. We watch people do this again on every cycle. And as many times as I've tried to tell that story to people in a one-on-one -on -one setting, I'll still, I'll, I'll bump back into the, I just had this, I've had this conversation three times with a friend of mine. I just had, he just did a favor for me and I paid him in Bitcoin. And he said, I said, I want to send you Bitcoin for that. You know, he's like, oh, you know, I'm low. let me send you some Bitcoin. So I, was like, oh, I don't even know how to use my wallet. So he had a Coinbase wallet. I said, well, let's, we'll, we'll get you set up. And so he logs in and, I'll, and here I am in his, his Coinbase wallet and it's a bunch of shit coins. <laughs> you know, I was like, Oh, God, yeah. You know, so I, I was like, well, well but you, it's fine. What, what, what are you doing? It's I also told, fine. Yeah. yeah. No, it is. It is fine, but yeah. it's, um, I, yeah. We, uh, I think I had the exact same um, journey, I'd say. Uh, I always looked at it from a, techno a technology angle. So I played around with everything. I did all mm. these ICOs. Yeah. You know, new decentralized banks, blah, 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 everything, mm. everything down, <laughs> you know. But I think it's also needed because it is, uh, you know, looking at it from a technology perspective or a number go up perspective, I think is, is one of the main two ways that you get into this right and um when i when i talk to to people who are also like yeah but i'm also trading all these other crypto things and blah blah i'm like you know go ahead and do that and once you figure out that you know you cannot beat any insider groups or pump and dump scheme or you figure out that you know that new bank that's going to be built on ethereum is never going to happen then you know just come back and then we'll talk about why why bitcoin is different you know and i think mm -hmm. you what you you said previously you know uh, we can only experience that what bitcoin brings us once you know what the impact is of finite digital scarcity the the, the discovery of that the fact that um you know, the creator is gone. It's truly uh, open source and decentralized and all these things. Like there is all the other cryptos are attempts by startups to create an, an, an ecosystem where the token that they create, you know, fulfills some sort of role. And from that, it derives its value, right? I think yeah. that is what it is conceptually. But they are already getting value or a price before the product is even live at their token generation event or whatever. And so I think once you realize that, you know, that is the real speculation and fine, you know, like if you want to gamble mm -hmm. and speculate, you know, go go for it. But right. that is not what, what Bitcoin is about. Right. And you can only discover that once you see that, that difference, I think. I think you're 100% correct. Uh, it's not to say that, that some very interesting business model won't emerge from the altcoin space. Uh, but Agreed. if you're here to help humanity, if you're here to separate money from the state, it's Bitcoin. Uh, and that's the most yes. powerful and most important movement in the entire system. Um, and so in, in that regard, I, I, you know, I don't want to shame or, or insult altcoiners away from owning Bitcoin. I think most of them already do, and they do see the value of that. Um, what I what I really dislike is the the confusion and uh, the warping of these altcoin stories to try and pretend that there's some sort of hard money, uh, that there's some sort of Bitcoin competitor. That's I think really 
really sort of evil at its core because uh, nothing is going to compare to Bitcoin in that, that standard. Yeah. Well, I think that also comes from your own uh, understanding and, and values change around that. I 100% agree, you know, like it's their marketing. But if you fall for that uh, because you participate, you know, it's funny because if you participate in a system or a wave of a trend that you don't understand enough, mm -hmm. you know, then then you're going to be made advantage of. And, you know, that's a pity, but I think it's the only way to learn. You mm -hmm. know, I have yet to fully orange pill people one on one like you know you do not orange pill someone else they orange pill themselves right so they yeah. have to go through that pain of right. of being like okay i'm now into this crypto thing and you know well yeah. you know you have to get rugs you have to lose coins you have to lose keys like you know you have to yeah. sell early you know like all these Been things there, done that. are i think part of that journey yeah, yeah. and yeah, so absolutely. how how did bitcoin how did bitcoin change you or or your values along the way um so so for for me it's a centering of sorts and that it is it's at the core of a bigger belief system in trying to find the true value in so many things so I have, I have, you know, if you go to my Twitter, you'll see it says hard money, real food, tough love. And that, that, that that's sort of the, the guiding principles of which I've centered on once I began to realize, uh, or I guess sort of under, comprehend Bitcoin at a deeper level. Hard money, I think we all understand. Uh, real food, is, I, I, I think the corruption in the food pyramid is horrific and disgusting. Uh, and the food and drug system is horrific and disgusting. Um, in, in media, um, in, in spirituality, so, so many things that we, we utilize and touch in, in any, in any, uh, every given day. Once you, whatever, whatever system you work in, right, or wherever you spend most of your time, you, you can find the corrupting strains and you can find the, the lies, you can find the mistruths, you can find um, the, the, all, you know, the, all the things that are wrong with that system. And it all comes back to that center of the spoke, which is corruption and money. And, and so you, you, you can either start from out here in whatever life you're living today. And you see, you see, I see this happening everywhere, right? I see people, I think COVID woke up a ton of people about the corruption in the health system. And I see people waking up about the corruption in the food system, right? You see people waking up about the corruption in uh, the uh, voting system in the United States, the corruption in the legal system, right? So, so wherever it's coming from, once you start digging in there, you, you peel it all the way back to the money. And so, so this is, I think, why I see all these people around the yes. world and I go, and I hear them talk and I say, oh shit, you're a Bitcoiner. You haven't even figured it out yet. Because what, what I mean by that is, is this yes. Bitcoin yes. culture, right? This Bitcoin culture of this, I want to know the truth. I don't care. I want to know what the truth is. And then once I understand the truth, then I can properly navigate this system. And so to me, Bitcoin centering around truth allows you sort of a, a base layer or a template by which to start to discern all these other verticals. And, and that calling those systems out, digging for the truth, that's tough love. That's just saying, regardless of how it hurts yep. you, regardless of how it hurts me, we're going to get to the truth of this system and i mean i lived a, a whole bunch of freaking lies we all have because either we weren't aware or because we're fooling ourselves or we just it's too hard to figure out too much work to deal with once, once you settle on bitcoin it changes you and you start to say I, I just don't give a shit i want to know the truth 
I want to know how this works, or I'm just going to opt out. And so that, I mean, that's the way it's impacted me. And it's just brought a lot more clarity and a lot more, um, or a lot less tolerance for bullshit in all the other systems. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. When you say truth, I think about, and, and I think this is how it went for me. Once you understand how Bitcoin works, you know, it's just a set of rules. It's just a protocol. There's 20,000 computers that every 10 minutes, you know, give the thumbs up like, yes, it still works like this. The ledger is still okay. Once you start to understand, I, I only understood it after I saw someone tweet something like Bitcoin is, is like uh, ultimate engineered truth or something like that. But just if, if, you, if you think at it, of it from a technology perspective it's literally just that you know yeah. this is a 600 gigabyte database with a long string of letters and numbers that is just verified every 10 minutes and that is the truth true consensus that is the truth of this system and i think once you understand that from a technological perspective and you zoom out a bit you realize that something like ultimate truth is actually possible. And once you realize that if you take that ultimate truth, as, as we just said before, as the base layer of anything you do on top of it, you have to conform to that ultimate truth. So anything downstream from the ultimate truth will be aligned with, with that. And so also as you said you know everything you want to fix in the world is downstream from broken and bad money and if you go all the way back to the origin of that money as I, as we talked about at the beginning of this conversation that is based on you know you you can look at it from different angles but i think it's based on creating or defying nature laws right De creating energy from nothing it's just impossible it's based on nothing it's it's a push of a of a button and we are forced to eventually use that in real life value exchanges where we exchange time and energy for that thing that's created from from just nothing. I think that's that's how I look at what yeah. you just said, you know, because well, you, that, you, yeah. Oh, I, I was just gonna say I, I have never uh, I hadn't really thought about this prior, but it, this thought came to me while you were speaking that that, that Bitcoin for me and I I. I think possibly for humanity might be the first time in history where we benefit from truth as an individual meaning yes yes meaning there's so many incentives in in life to white lie tell a lie and to benefit from the lie or not telling the full truth where in Bitcoin, the Bitcoin standard, we all benefit the most by anchoring on truth. Yes. And, it, and it's, it's a paradigm shift, right? It's a paradigm because shift, it, exactly. if you lie and try to cheat, you are not allowed to use the system. Yeah. Right? So but fully the fiat aligning money, with that. Yeah. yeah. Fully yeah. aligning but with that. But the fiat that money truth. system... Yeah, sorry, we have a little lag. So <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> right. I get comments on YouTube again. Let the guy talk, you know. But we have a little lag, guys. <laughs> Chill out. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so, so yeah, I think I think you're totally right. You, we by anchoring on the truth as all individually benefiting by fully going all in on the truth. Yes, that changes, right? I, I, like as a little kid, as a little kid, that's unfair. You're cheating. And, and then you learn that if you want to compete, maybe you don't say the full truth. Maybe you cheat a little bit. Maybe you find a way to hack the system and, and get your share to make sure you're competing with everybody else. Bitcoin incentivizes just the opposite. So it's like this return yes. to innocence, this return to, I can anchor on the truth. This is a completely fair game. All I have to do is play the game by the rules as hard as I can, put as much work, as much energy, as much effort into it, and I will extract as much value as possible from this system. And so aligning yes. your efforts with the truth is the way you win in this system. It's a fucking game changer. 
I can't think of any other yes. system on the yes. planet where it works that way. Could not agree more. This is this is it. It's the mutually beneficial game where because you don't have to, you're not forced to trust others. You can trust yourself. So if you say I follow the rules, I know that the people who follow the rule do it because everyone else, you know, again follows the rules. And the fiat money system is a zero sum game, a zero sum game, right? So I win, you you lose. That's the entire mentality. And I, I think it's interesting you mentioned, you know, being a kid or, or children in general. That's what we teach them, right? And I think to go back to the to the part about why is Bitcoin such a big idea? We can change this entire attitude, right? We we can we can just change that. That for me is kind of like the tip of the paradigm shift, right? Yeah. If we eventually get there and everything is aligned with a baseline truth, then the incentives are to to do things <laughs> that are aligned to that truth. It's it's only positivity from there. And and that part about uh you know trusting really trusting yourself or getting the space to figure out how and if you can trust yourself. I think that's kind of where the the spiritual part comes in. And and it's also something I want to ask you a question about because you you have a presentation where you say Bitcoin insights have sparked a spiritual and philosophical re-evaluation of money's role, promising a moral revolution in society. And I think that's what we are talking about, right? Mm -hmm. If if we are rewarded for doing the good thing, and other people are too, then that can only build up to a, a way better society anywhere. I agree. Um... I, I do. I, I think this is kind of at the core of what we just talked about, um, and and I think why why I sort of intuit that feeling about uh, Bitcoin's moral value, um, and it it is this process that it doesn't matter whether you're Michael Saylor or an eighteen year old kid mowing lawns. Everybody has an equal seat at this game and 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 nobody yes. is uh able to um impact game it or, the game. or affect it or game the game right that's a great way to put it and so it it orientates people around and, and granted like I didn't, I didn't you know like i said before i didn't i didn't grok this immediately i made all the mistakes so so if you're no, making those no. mistakes you know just, just whatever keep going because eventually you come to this point where you realize that that adhering to the protocol aligns you with the moral values of truth, aligns you, therefore, with the Bitcoin community, which are all focused on this alignment towards putting their energy and their effort into this truth machine. And out of that, or, or, or maybe that's an anchor for all the other positive values that are embedded within us as humans that we want to, we want to release, but have never had the financial incentive to release. Mm -hmm. So the the well, not not in yeah, not maybe not in like our known history. Maybe it yeah. was different way way back, but yes, a hundred percent and and what you said you know I, I think it's so fascinating to me that so many different people from so many different parts of the world so many different backgrounds ages religions races whatever like all these things don't matter in bitcoin mm -hmm. that they they come to the same conclusion about bitcoin and they are converging on this thing right and i think what what we talked about before to to you know really create a societal or worldwide change like that that is what the network state is, right? The the, the mm -hmm. concept of 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 Falaji. I I think that Bitcoin is the the network state already in that sense, right? And that it doesn't have to be a big group, but it especially does not have to be a big group because it's global, right? Any other revolution, and I think when we talk about revolution, it's about separating money from state, right? That's probably the last. Yeah. big revolution that 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 we are aiming towards like the separation of church and state 
that was all local from local to local to local this is global instantly 24 7 365 you know uh even think, with think a, about... a podcast like this anyone can listen to it anytime anywhere Think, think about that, that point in history of separating church from state. Why, why was that such a push? And I, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying this to like piss off anybody who's following any specific religion. But if you're in one religion, you could look at all the others. If, you, if, you, if you're believing in one faith, you could look at the others and, and you could find fault, right? You can find fault, you can find mm -hmm. corruption, you can find power. You can find censorship. You can find lies. However you want to do that. I, I like to look at religion as more like a control structure. And as, as the state started to use religion to corrupt its population, to control its population, the people began to feel the need to separate the church from the state so that they could pull it back into their own hands and reconnect spiritually. Because yeah. the state meddling in this religious value was, was an overreach of control and power and corruption into what was initially theirs. We're, we're seeing the exact same thing in money, and this is why Bitcoin has emerged as a way to separate money from state. Because they were using, they're using money, and we're seeing it more and more every day as a way to contr corrupt, control, censor the populace. Right. So, so it's 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 literally history repeating itself at the next layer, like so many things throughout history. It's these cycles, and, and here we are again. And this is why it's it's so important for humanity to separate money from state to get it back, to get back sovereignty, to get back property rights, to get back your control. And it's, right, when you start to think about CBDCs, you start to think about financial censorship, uh, you, you, what happened with the truckers in Canada. We all know these things. We've all seen these things. It just becomes more and more evident that the fight is here. And if we don't push now, we could lose it forever. So we, we have to push hard, as hard as we can as, uh, to, to make sure that this future exists for everybody. Yeah. When, when you say this, I think about, you know, perhaps people are listening and think about, oh, this is so, such hyperbolic talk, right? Kind of doom and gloom, et cetera. Uh, it's funny because I, I, I sometimes have thought that of other people I don't think this is doom and gloom. I think it's very rational. It's just very uh, unemotional, just looking at not what people say, but looking at what, what they yeah. are doing, right? It's... And I think, too, when I think about the size of this, right, like where are we? I think we, we touched upon spirituality also a bit, right? Like I feel lots of arguments, and maybe you experienced that too, or before, you know, when, when, when you when you pinch, pitched in your TradFi career, Bitcoin, and people say, well, but we cannot talk about that. Right? Like the people are so stuck in, 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 in what is created around them that they, they are not even aware of the fact that they are stuck. Therefore, they're also not questioning it, questioning mm -hmm. it. But when they hear something like this, what we are talking about, right? I sometimes feel like uh, people have like a Disney view of the world, right? There's a good guy, there's a bad guy. And I'm probably not on the side where the bad guy is the, is the boss, right? <laughs> something like that. So whenever you hear people talk like this, I, I think it's, it's as simple uh, or maybe it's complicated, but as that, right? It's just the, the, the dissonance. It's, it's just, I, I don't want to believe that I'm a subject in, you know, what this Paul guy is now sharing, right? I, yeah, that's an easy cop out. It's 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 the it's the easy choice, hard life, right? The easy cop out gives you a hard life because you still don't understand why your groceries are four times exp as expensive as four years ago, you know. But once you do make the hard choice to be like okay well let's let's see how this works then or let's see what people do and what i actually think about it and what it does for me or against me or whatever you know you start with a blank slate i think um this, but is, this is uh, this is for me why it's so big 
yeah, it's a, it's a spiritual also, thing eventually. It's also difficult to break into their matrix, right? Because their wall, their feed. Oh, I have visitors. Hi, puppies. How are you? I've got. Uh, I'm sitting in our studio to be and uh, have visitors right now, so so don't mind the uh, commotion around me. Um, but so to break into their matrix, to break into their feed, right? You've they've got their social media. That's their algorithm that's feeding them whatever they believe, whatever they want to interact with. And so to throw this into the system outside of their their existing matrix, it, it it's really uncomprehensible to them, right? It really disrupts and it's hard for them to absorb what we're the matrix that we're living in every day or the algorithm we're living in every day. So so what I have found is that just being me, as crazy as they might think I am and ignoring it, and talking about this stuff in front of them while their phone is on and getting them to engage with me, eventually that stuff starts to hit their wall. It starts to hit their algorithm. Yeah. And then for the, you know, I, they talk with me for, for a few times and then months later they're like, they're sending me posts from TikTok or from Facebook about some bit of corruption. I'm like, aha, I entered your algorithm, right? I'm in your system now. And now you're starting to see the things that have been in my feed for years. So, so I, I feel like it's not all for naught, right? We don't, we don't have to orange pill them immediately, but we can plant the seeds. And that seed starts to grow inside their algorithm. And they start to wake up. And this is why I think this is sort of like the pushback that the powers that be are seeing when they implemented uh, the COVID operation, let's call it, when they, they implement, you know, any of these corrupt activities. When people like us come in and try and wake them up or we send them, uh, we text them a link and they click on it, we're dripping that into their feed. And if they engage with it, it's going to increase the engagement. And so it's a way to sort of hack their system without them even knowing it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's just so fascinating that I, uh, once you, it also, it's again, sounds, sounds kind of sometimes, uh, that I'm, that, that I'm talking, I don't know the English word, but like, uh, like I'm above other people. It's not like that, but I mm -hmm. think like once you see that, you cannot just go back. Like it, mm -hmm. it, it would be a disservice to yourself if you go back and ignore it, right? And I, I think about, and I mean, I was there. I, I say this a lot on a podcast. When I was 30, I worked at a bank. I had a mortgage, and someone explained to me, a colleague, that the money in the bank wasn't mine. And I was like, "What are you talking about?" You know. So I got hit with that too. Mm -hmm. And I always think about, you know, it's the matrix, the guy that still wants to eat steak. Like you cannot go back. Like that is a that is a that is a disservice to yourself, right? But yeah. what I like is that ab about Bitcoin, like once you adopt Bitcoin, the the, the 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 depth and breadth of dimensions is is insane. But and and I wanted to mention like one of your uh quotes or tweets. I don't know, when I researched you, I wrote this down, but you said Bitcoin has hacked into our selfish desires for wealth and abundance to kickstart global adoption. As that adoption and price increases, Bitcoiners evolve, change their time preference, develop hope, and the Bitcoin's energy, Bitcoiners' energy shifts our focus from me to us. Mm -hmm. And I love that, man. Like yeah, I just wanted to tell yeah. you that. Like I love that, and, and that's what we talked about. This zero yeah. sum game is me versus you, and the player yeah. versus play. You know, and, and but 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 the mutually beneficial game is the togetherness and building towards something that is bigger than our individual life. You know, uh, I mean that is what I feel that when I say that. Like that right. gives me hope too. You right know, on, because man. the future is uncertain for everyone. That's you right. Know? So why not work together to, you know, have some sort of grand picture of the future or hope or however you want to call it, right? Like that—that yeah. that is a better day-to-day -day feeling than feeling like you're a subject of something that you do not understand. I agree. Um, I, 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 
I love that whole line of thinking. Um, it's it was driven from this idea in a talk I gave about trinities within Bitcoin, and one of one of the trinities mm. is what we call the psychological trinity. And and this is the idea that you, you first you have a thought, and a thought creates a feeling, and from that feeling it drives behavior. Right. So, I mean, this is a, yes. a, a very well known philosophical and, and psychological uh, trifecta. And and so through Bitcoin, when you begin to really deeply understand Bitcoin, you go, oh my God, I'm going to be wealthy. That thought of I'm going to be wealthy, it's just a matter of time, leads to a feeling of success and abundance and being proud of yourself. Like I figured something out. I've, I figured out a system by aligning with this truth that I'm going to be successful. I'm going to provide for my family. I am going to have wealth. I'm going to achieve the things I wanted in life. And then that changes your behavior. You start, when you start to exude that, when you start to feel that, it changes the way you behave in society. You start to align with th that those moral imperatives you start to align with i want to help others i want to show others that they too can reach this point and it, it to, like in the in the spiritual world there's a or the spiritual community let's say there's this little story called the empty cup theory are you familiar with the empty cup theory no so so the empty cup theory is is such that in order for you to fill up the other cups in your community, you first have to fill yours up. And so as you begin to pour water into a cup and your cup becomes plentiful with the you know life's or the water of life, if you don't first take care of your cup, you could have a leak in your cup. You get it form a crack in your cup, and all that life's energy will be just drained out of it. And you'll constantly be filling it up. But because your cup is broken, you're not going to retain any of that goodness that you need. So it first starts with constructing your cup. This is, this is fixing your thoughts, right? I'm going to first start with um, building an ironclad thought process, a positive thought process. I'm going to believe in my success. And I think, I think Bitcoin uh, builds that cup for you. Because through the process of learning and understanding Bitcoin, you 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 begin to understand that that success becomes inevitable if you just play the game properly, with a proper cup, with private keys, with holding your own keys, right? They stay humble, stack ads. It's not your keys, not your coins. Don't shit coin, right? Those are the structures of the cup that allow you to fill it up with that goodness of Bitcoin. Once it's full, then it'll start to overflow naturally into the cups below you, right? It'll start to overflow into your family and into your community. And because your cup is solid, you can do that in a way that it doesn't drain your cup. It just overflows from your cup. And then it becomes your, you become a leader in your community. You become uh, someone that people can go to to learn how to strengthen their own cups how to build a strong, strong cup, how to hold their keys properly, how to uh, stay away from uh, shit coins and, and stay away from corrupt activities that are draining their life force. So you help them build their strong cups. And as your cup is overflowing and their cups are filling up, then it overflows into their families and their community. And that entire pyramid of flowing cups builds the, the Bitcoin network in a strong and resilient way. So this is why, like, um, all these Bitcoin memes and uh, being a Bitcoin maximalist is actually really important to forming the the cultural framework, the moral framework, and guidelines by which people form their cups and then can overflow to others. So, so that 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 whole pyramid of life force 
is something that that I see happening in the Bitcoin community, and that this is just a sort of a way to help people understand that these feelings inside of them of of wanting to help others, want to bring others along with them, these are natural uh, thoughts and feelings that lead to good quality behaviors. So this is this little psychological trinity that's that's evolving the Bitcoin network. Yeah, dude. I love that. I I, I, oh, I I want to say, based upon what you said, for anyone listening who thinks about how can I contribute to Bitcoin, I think for me, the answer is doesn't matter. You can do anything to help, you know, strengthen your own cup or help others build their cup, right? I think that's exactly what, what you're saying. And so if you feel like you want to do something, but you don't know what, just do something. I started this, you know, like a, no experience beforehand, um, and I'm just learning as I go because I don't know. I I like it now, you know, so I'm mm -hmm. continuing. But it doesn't matter what you do, right? How I, how you contribute agree. to this Bitcoin thing? I agree. I agree. Yeah. And so, what do you think are like the thoughts, behaviors, and feelings that hold people back from taking Bitcoin seriously and and then studying it? Oh, I mean, I, I can tell you all the pushback and fears that I hear from people that I talk to, right? That um, <laughs> that was my next question. <laughs> oh, sorry, but uh, no, I no, mean, go ahead. I think it's. Uh, I mean, they they tell me, right? Like, well, the government's going. I mean, it's all, nothing you haven't heard. The government's going to ban it. There's no way if it's as good as you say it is, the government's never going to let us have it. Um, there's got to be a backdoor, a bug, a hack. How can you trust it? Um, it? It had to be created by the CIA, CIA or the NSA, and, and therefore uh, we're all going to get rugged eventually. Right? So, I mean, those are the people that actually go deep enough to to get there. All the other mm -hmm. stuff, I just completely discount. The whole, like, oh, it's a Ponzi scheme, or it's rat, <laughs> or it's rat poison. Charlie Munger or Warren Buffer, whoever said that, right? The stuff that they, where they just discount it immediately. Yeah. I, I don't even take them seriously. But I, I've, I've had, yeah. I have friends and and family that have taken it seriously and gone deep down the rabbit hole with me and actually accumulated coins. And I still, they're still nervous. They still can't get beyond those sort of things that we just talked about where they just they feel like i can have this but i need to keep it secret i can't tell anybody if i talk about it they're going to take it from me um so there is still a deep fear uh that they're doing something immoral they're doing something wrong that daddy government's not going to approve of and 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 so it it does take a level of confidence in the protocol to be able to stand up and in yourself to be able to stand up and say, I'm going to hold this myself. I'm going to be self-sovereign. I'm taking control of my keys. I'm going to do proper OPSEC. I'm going to have multi-SIGs in place. That's a, and that is a big ask for a lot of these people. And I think because maybe technically they're afraid or they're not willing to put in the effort, they sit in fear. So yeah. I've, whenever I've been confronted with fear, fear is a big motivator for me. So when I get to the point where I was like, well, this is, becomes a risk to, like, to do this, to go on a podcast and do what we're doing today and talk about Bitcoin, that's a risk, right? People, people now know who we are. They know that we're in the Bitcoin community. I think about those risks. And I don't know about where, you know, the way you think about these things, but, you know, I have guns. My family knows how to use guns. We have proper security of our Bitcoin, right? We don't have all of our keys in one location. So, so we, we're prepared to defend ourselves for this, this ability to have sovereignty and freedom and to deliver something valuable to the world. That's the cup, right, for us. It's, it's all of those things to build that cup. In other areas where you, where you maybe you don't have the ability to do that, you've got to do what you can do. But we all have to be brave enough at some point to stand up and and stand for what's right for us and for the rest of humanity, or or 
or we're not going to get this thing. We're not going to be able to deliver it to the masses, right? Like we said, yeah. in the, like we said in the beginning, we want to provide greener fields for the sheep. We want to we want to build this pasture so resilient and so strong that we can open the gates and invite everybody in. We're we're not going to do that by educating everybody and teaching everybody to hold their own keys. It's just physically impossible, and we don't have enough time. But we can do it. A small group of us can do it. And then we can provide a safe, lush, abundant environment for everybody else to come to. And I, I think that's the way it has to happen. Yeah. I, uh, when, when you say, like, you know, if it's so good, the government's going to confiscate it. When I hear that, I think I always say, like, this is, you're, you're, this is the point. <laughs> you are making the point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Great. Well said. If well they said. are paying, to, paying attention, do you, do you think it has value? Right? Why why would they pay attention to a random uh, you know internet idea if it doesn't have any value? You know, so people are contradicting themselves. But I think it's also uh, we just touched upon it before. But like it's the trust in yourself. Can I understand this? Do I have the time to do this? You know, what do I actually think about X Y Z? How did I come to that uh, conclusion or con uh, conviction or whatever? And the uh, realization for most people is that they, they don't know mm -hmm. you know they, they don't know why they think certain things about certain things or feel certain way about right. certain things right and that that inward kind of journey is yeah we talked about this before but i i i feel like it's mostly that because it's not about intelligence right understanding bitcoin is it's 100 percent not about iq or intelligence it's mm -hmm. about you know your emotional resilience or emotional curiosity or something like that you know to to just reflect on yourself who am i what am i all these things mm -hmm. um and so that 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 pe people who use the the easily dismissible arguments you know like it's a ponzi or it's a cult you know um mm -hmm. Th those are not the people I think you should also try to convince because they are very far away from challenging their own own beliefs. Absolutely, absolutely. You can you, those are the best people. Uh, the best way I think to sort of orange pill those people is through example. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So we're building the thing and mm -hmm. we're talking about the thing. Yeah. You know, and we're showing what it does for us. Yeah. Yeah. One hundred percent agree. So, do you think Bitcoin is inevitable? uh inevitable no i don't think it's inevitable i think we do have to work for it um i don't think we could just stop and it'll just happen on its own um because well i, I mean i'll tell you from from working in the space every day we are constantly hit with roadblocks moats regulatory compliance things that make sense or that are set up to keep TradFi alive and keep us struggling. It's, 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 I mean, I, I could talk about this for another four hours. It's, it's really, when you start to work in the system, you begin to see immediately that the regulatory framework is purely a moat to keep a system alive that would otherwise be dead in a free market. In a free market with banking, we would destroy them. I have no doubt about that. At the same time, the regulatory moat makes us have to be compliant with them, makes us have to work with them. And then through choke points, through regulation, through lack of regulatory clarity, purposely, delivering a lack of clarity. They op they keep systems in place that allow them to at will come in and close gateways, close doors, close off systems that where we see us getting too much entrance into TradFi. I think the whole yep. the whole Wall Street thing with ETF, we're in that system because in that system Bitcoin is not a bare instrument. You know, yes. the, the, the client can't extract yes. the coin. I agree. Um, so, so it's like yeah. we can let that in. 
we can hold the asset. It can be on our balance sheet. We can benefit from that and we can give the people an IOU. And, yeah. you know, but, but where we interact directly, where real Bitcoin values interact with TradFi, um, it, it, you see it every day. They're doing a lot to keep us out of the walled garden. Yeah. Well, and this is also one of the arguments, right, that people use, like, oh, it's co-opted by Wall Street, etc. No, you have to understand that, yes, they want it, but that's the point <laughs> again. Right? Like, why would they want something that does not have value? Why would they want it inside their walled garden? You know, why shouldn't you buy an ETF and buy the real thing? You know, like mm -hmm. that. It. I don't know. Sometimes it's so easy to just turn around the argument, you know, and then I think like, yeah, just just think about what you're saying, yeah. right? You're saying something to dismiss this thing, but, and that is, that is proving the point. There, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. All right, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, my last question, and I ask everyone the same question to wrap this up, and that's what is a core belief that you will never let go. Um. <laughs> nothing gets fixed until it's broken <laughs> that's a good one i like that yeah i'm gonna make a compilation at the end uh, at, after 100 episodes i want to make a compilation <laughs> awesome. of what everyone answered awesome. as an answer to this question well paul thanks so much man i uh, i really enjoyed this conversation uh, no i advice. really appreciate your time i'll make sure to uh, add your twitter profile to the episode uh, description so people can follow you and uh, yeah man really appreciate it i Thank really you. enjoyed talking to you bram it was great and uh, hope to talk to you again in the, in the future are you going to be in nashville no not nashville but i'll probably be uh, uh somewhere else uh, okay. also in the states so uh we'll be we'll in connect. touch and hopefully awesome. we can meet uh, in real life i would yeah, love man. to do that Cheers. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, check out some of my other episodes to learn why Bitcoin is the most important subject you must understand and adopt. If you want, you can follow and connect with me on Twitter X. I'm at Bram K. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you have any feedback or questions, just reach out. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for our next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.